The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. What does it sound like in heaven? Are angels playing harps there or singing choirs of praise? Why do NDEers sometimes report they heard the most beautiful music ever on the other side? Welcome to this week's edition of IN's NDE Radio, brought to you by the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Today we are continuing our discussion of Heaven's Vibrations with James Bean, a main base scholar of comparative religions, writer, book reviewer, public speaker, and radio producer and host of Spiritual Awakenings Radio. James, welcome back to the show. Greetings. Thanks for having good me. To hear, good to have, hear your voice. Um, many NDE reports, even going back to Plato's story of, of Ur, speak of the sounds of heaven. Right? I think Ur describes columns of light in which angels stand singing different tones. And um, you've done a, a wonderful paper uh, um, on the sounds of, of the world religions, inner and outer sound of the world's religions, which I just finished reading. It's ah, quite massive. 8,000 8, <laughs> words or so. Full of the most wonderful quotes about, uh, from different traditions about uh, music and sound and, and the spiritual. So uh, maybe we should, we should talk about that. Um, you mentioned uh, in the beginning of your article, in the, the sound of God's voice said, let there be. And in the beginning was the word, the logos, the tau, the shabda, the nada, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, we could begin with that, with the voice of God. Yes, all of the creation accounts have sound at the beginning. Uh, in Hinduism, the Om, A-U-M, or sometimes spelled Om, Om as an Om chant, and mm -hmm. let there be in the Quran, and all became, and God said, let there be light, and then there was light. And so uh, a, a voice of God doing the creating, that is, of course, sound, uh, the voice of God. And in in most every religion, it's the, the very same thing. And of course, uh, I've taken note in recent years, the super string theory, M theory, the idea of especially Michio Kaku's um, way of uh, describing uh, uh, a super string that vibrates the multiverse into existence, and I kind of uh, take note of that <laughs> as being perhaps mm -hmm. another uh, another form of creation story um, with uh, a vibration uh, as the basis for existence. Right. Well, you mentioned also the Australian Aborigines uh, song lines, um, which is, uh, I guess, singing, sang the world into existence, but also keeps it and maintains it. Um, right. Yes, and that's true of in, in the East. The, uh, the those who practice inner sound meditation, they see it as a continuing sound. Uh, the sound continues uh, uh, even as the 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 sound of the Big Bang is still echoing. The static between stations on FM, that hissing st static. Uh, scientists yes. say it represents the background radiation of the cosmos, what the leftover echo of the Big Bang, if you will. Mm -hmm. And in the in the mystical traditions that focus on sound, uh, the belief is that the sound is still reverberating. The sound is 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 more like a more like the Ganges, more like a river that is continuing to flow. Uh, and in fact, the uh, the soul it's kind of a, a a royal highway for the soul, if you will. We're all sort of connected um, by way of the sound. So, uh, for for them, sound and and spirit or Holy Spirit or part of God, you know, that is is within every living thing. That those are all interchangeable terms, really. Sound and and spirit. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the book of the Hopi. And uh, quote all the vibratory centers along the Earth's axis from pole to pole resounded his call. The Earth trembled, the universe quivered in tune. Thus he made the whole world an instrument of sound, and an instrument for carrying messages, resounding praise to the Creator of all. I love that. 
Yeah, that's an amazing book. The Book of the Hopi, and that, that of course, is one of the oldest tribes with an intact uh, Native American culture on the North American continent. And there, too, uh, in their wonderful uh, version of Genesis, uh, the creator sings the song of creation, and these clay-like figures come to life, the um, Adam and Eve, quote-unquote, you know, if you will, mm. come, come to life as a result of this sound of creation. And, of course, anyone who's familiar with Shab Yoga or Nada Yoga from India, they, they go, aha, this is like another way of saying <laughs> that we're made alive by this divine sound going on in the cosmos. Right. The, the breath of life that God breathed into us uh, no doubt had a vibration connected with it. I, I, I think of it as, a, as an auditory vibration as well as a breath vibration. <laughs> Absolutely. And those Sufi poets like Rumi that talk about the breath of God, uh, you know, blowing through the reed flute, making sound. And so the human body is like the reed and the breath flowing through it is God. Mm. And thus there is sound produced. <laughs> I also noted, uh, as I got into into your article, uh, the sound of silence. And I thought that had originated with Simon and Garfunkel's song, but apparently it goes much further back than that. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoy uh, the Buddhist take on, well, meditation in general and sound meditation to it, because it's coming from a very experiential, sitting on one's meditation cushion perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, in fact, I picked out this paragraph to read because I think it illustrates how people hear sound and uh, this is uh, on the sound of silence. Uh, Ajahn Sumedhu is a Buddhist teacher in Theravadan Buddhism and, ha and has a book called The Sound of Silence. And this paragraph for me has always pretty much framed the whole concept of hearing sound. He says, as you calm down, you can experience the sound of silence in the mind. You hear it as a kind of high-frequency sound, a ringing sound that's always there. It's just normally never noticed. Now, when you begin to hear that sound of silence, it's a sign of emptiness, of silence of the mind. It is something you can always turn to. As you concentrate on it, turn to it. Uh, it can make you quite peaceful and blissful. Meditating on that, you have a way of letting the conditions of the mind cease without suppressing them with another condition. I just love that paragraph. There's this ringing sound going on. Mm -hmm. It's always there. Most people don't notice it because traffic noises and and just all of the sounds of life kind of clutter it out. But it's there. If we just abide in the silence long enough, we might be able to hear it. Right. Well, as my in my job as a palliative care chaplain at Eastern Maine Medical, I um, often tell people who have a, a relative who is perhaps dying, but in a coma or asleep, that um, they can hear. And hearing seems to be the last uh, sense of ours that uh, that continues. Right. And it, seem, it seems to me that um, it may be that that's because we are uh, built to be listening at the point of death, that we're looking for that sound. I've heard it said that yeah, the physical sense of hearing is the last sense to go. Uh, yeah, that is very true. And in uh, the near-death experiences, for many years, uh, I have read accounts of people hearing beautiful heavenly music. Uh, and it pretty much is across the spectrum. Even on the 700 Club, some evangelical near-death book uh, talk about uh, talks about the 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 notes between the keys, or in other words, the heavenly music is much more. Uh, sophisticated than earthly music, and so there are many, many more notes, <laughs> and it's just amazingly beautiful, and uh, that that is one of the, it's not quite as common as light or visions, but quite frequently there, there are accounts um, of people experiencing beautiful music, heavenly music, angelic music, as part of their near-death experience. Mm. I'm always glad when the Christian channels pick up on some aspect of the near-death experience. And it, it reminded me uh, of that when uh, 
I came on this quote that you, in your article, what else is Christ but the sound of God, which comes from the Acts of John. Yeah, this book called The Acts of John, I collect those apocryphal writings and, and include yes. those too. That's kind of one unique thing about my uh, stuff in addition to um, Buddhist, um, Christian, Jewish, Koran, and, and so on. I also include those apocryphal Western uh, books, some of those Gnostic Gospels. and Right, and I, no doubt uh, many of those... Um were writings were inspired by people who've had mystical or near death like experiences in their lives and and then are compelled to sit down and write write about it yes uh, in, i have seen in uh, there's a the the mandaean scriptures uh of iraq they're sort of a john the baptist type sect from ancient times a uh, very old group they speak aramaic a dialect of aramaic uh, I have read in their scriptures accounts that sound like ancient NDEs, you know, ancient near-death experiences, uh, uh, crossing over to the other side and having a an, an escort, a guide that comes to meet the soul after it has passed on. And it, it sounds a lot like uh, Life After Life by Raymond Moody. Right, or um, or perhaps Dante's uh, travels through you know the Inferno to Paradise. Absolutely. A, Some of those mystics I, were uh, kind of delving into the same realm. Mm. Uh, you mentioned Richard R- Roll or Rolly, um, and this quote, when Christ wishes it, he receives within himself the song sent into him from the heavens, and his meditation is changed into melody, and his spirit lingers in marvelous harmony. And I think that's that's available to us as well. Oh, absolutely, everyone. Everyone, the sound yeah. is within everyone, every living thing. And it's just a matter of uh, meditating to hear it, and that's where, of course, some have a, a tough time because we're so used to either being in the body or in our mind, in our thoughts, and we don't uh, really switch off either of those. We don't, uh, you know, turn the lights out and sit in the dark and, you know, and, and just focus on the silence and the darkness we we always like to be seeing or doing something or or uh thinking about something so we 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 kind of are in a place where it's hard to find the off button if you will for the regular our regular state of consciousness in order to delve into that other realm but if we do uh we we start to explore this inner la- this inner landscape that's within everyone and start uh encountering the inner lights and in- inner sounds and so it's like the unexplored rooms of the house. The house with we have to have to shut down that busy brain of ours, and in order to hear the the our spiritual side. Yeah, if we can do that and abide in the silence, and I think for 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 most most people find it hard to meditate, but it's because they haven't really tried before, and after you keep at it, you know, it becomes uh, routine. But at first, like anything else, it, it requires uh, a little bit of effort, uh, and then it's not uh, difficult, really. But at first, yeah, when people first try and meditate, they hear their thoughts really loud and find it hard to settle down and probably had, you know, espresso before they sat down to try and meditate and have a lot of <laughs> caffeine flowing through their system. And But you get you get all, all past that if uh, you keep at it, you know, effort. Practice makes perfect. Exactly. Well, when I started the show, I asked a question about what what's the sound like in heaven, and Richard Roll has a wonderful quote about that, too, from your paper. In the light of God, which is called the kingdom of heaven, the sound is holy, soft, pleasant, lovely, pure, and thin. God, who is a spirit, has by and through his manifestation introduced himself into distinct spirits, which are the voices of his eternal pregnant harmony. In the manifested word of his great kingdom of joy, they are God's instrument in which his spirit melodizes in the kingdom of joy. They are angels, the flames of fire and light in a living, understanding dominion. Wow. <laughs> I love that description. And I think uh, I can I can uh, see that in uh, reports that we've had from uh, ND years. Yes, and he says that... Uh... The, all the music of the earth, all the greatest uh, classical composers and the greatest of instruments, you know, that's all like barking dogs 
in comparison to the great uh, divine sound. <laughs> I've always found that to be kind of a funny way, you know, uh, uh, it really drives home the point really well. <laughs> well, uh, and also somewhere in your paper as well, you mentioned that the sitar was supposed to emulate the music of the spheres or, or of, of the other side, and yet um, the, the, the man who tried to do that felt that it was a failure. Right, a glorious failure. failure. Yeah. We had a, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but we had someone inquire at IANS about um, people who had heard music from in their near-death experience, and would they get in touch with this person who was trying to write music that would emulate that uh, experience, and, and uh, she wanted to bounce it off people who had actually heard the other side. Right, and there are um, sacred music styles uh, and world music instruments that do imitate to some degree the divine sound uh tibetan bowls and bells and gongs those singing bowls uh do that really well uh some forms of chant like the Guyoto monks um i was listening to a program on the cbc called ideas you know many years ago uh about uh buddhist monks hearing inner sound and they devised a form of chant to try and reproduce it for their fellow Buddhists that were not hearing it. And they came up with this Gyoto monk, you know, this kind of growling chant with harmonic overtones in it um, to I- imitate something of that sound. Um, Hildegard of Bingen's chant sounds like angels on another plane, another level. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of world music he tries to imitate it. Uh, Constance Demby's music, I think, or you'll find certain uh, uh, electronic or or classical composers, you know, probably stray into those realms. Now, you said um, that you had um, figured out how to do that uh, multi-tone chant? I do that, yes. Would you like to give us an example? I could. It'll sound (laughs) like any sort of chant. It'll sound like, you know, Nanu, Nanu, take me to your leader, but I'm willing to give it a shot. (laughs) Okay, uh, and I don't know how the phone line works, but you might we might get lucky, and there'll be some frequency response uh, that comes through, you know, wide enough to allow it to be heard. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, two or three notes at the same time. like that wow. sounds, a, sounds a little bit like Popeye on acid uh, or you know <laughs> in, um, no it this, sounds much better than Popeye on acid oh, well, well that's good <laughs> that's good yeah it's actually used in, in folk music in some traditions like tuva uh, mm-hmm. you know and, and uh, China Vietnam and that part of the world we uh, had some singers come to uh, the American Folk Festival here in Bangor that did that a couple of years ago yeah, musicians do that um, to get their voice uh, kind of situated for singing. Uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've heard musicians do that before uh, as a way to loosen up the voice. And I do, I do that sometimes before doing a radio show as well. It clears out the uh, the vocal cords a bit. Hmm. Good for radio. Well, now you've done it. Now you've done it on the air. Is that, that, is be... that a first? <laughs> yes, and I hope people still <laughs> like me and are not. Too scared. <laughs> I, I think was I think was very good, and I've heard there's, the professionals, so I'm I'm glad. Yeah, I think you've mastered it. Yeah, there's an album uh, called "Hearing Solar Winds" by David Hikes and the Harmonic Choir, which is a whole choir of individuals doing overtone chant and a, in a very sacred sort of way. It's sort of like Gregorian plain chant, only overtone. <laughs> so that mm-hmm. is like a choir of angels from another realm that that has to be some of the most ethereal chant that ever has been created you have a quote from marjorie kemp in the mirror of love i heard a noise like wind blowing in my ears and knew it for the sound of the holy spirit which became like the voice of a dove when the lord spoke to me i lost all sense of time i did not know if he was with me five or six hours or only one it was so holy and full of grace that I felt as if I had been in heaven, which she might very well have been. 
Yeah, yeah. She's another one of those mystics. I think she was from the UK or uh, um, England and mm -hmm. had, uh, yeah, I remember seeing that book. I collect writings and ran across that passage one day and I thought, Eureka, I found another one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere, but especially the mystics, the mystical contemplative type people that spend some time in, in silence. Uh, so through meditation, some people have actually strayed into those uh, realms that uh, the near-death uh, writings have been describing. Uh, so so for, for the mystics, uh, when Life After Life by Raymond Moody was published back in the mid-70s, I believe, that was a kind of, for us, kind of a legalization of spirituality or mysticism. It's like you know, more okay to talk about these kinds of things than it used to be. So I, I just describe it as the legalization of spirituality. It's like we don't have to, like, hold back quite so much. You know, we can openly discuss uh, visions of heavens and, you know, out-of-body experiences. You know, we're not necessarily insane, mad, crazy, etc. <laughs> well, right, and it's it's a mystical experience that can happen to someone who is not even aware of the possibility or or a, a practitioner of any particular uh, uh, method of meditating or or whatever uh it just happens as a you know incidentally as a part of the death experience and um yeah. so many people come back confused by this and in fact this is one of the reasons Zions exists is to help people who have been uh startled and frightened and and whatever by uh, their NDE, but um, it really uh, democratizes spiritual and mystical experience. Um, it seems to be very universal. Uh, the near-death experience or mystical uh, experiences. If you put anyone in a cave and give them some meditation instructions, I would say a certain percentage will have uh, some kind of experience. So it seems to be universal, like. Uh, Gravity, you know, gravity works for everyone, atheists, Buddhists, Christians, gravity is there, <laughs> pulling, and, yes. you know, so it's, it's like that, it's a universal truth or reality, and uh, it's just potentially there for, for everyone. And I can't, I can't count the number of times in, in the course of doing chaplain work that I've raised, you know, a story about an NDE, usually for someone who has no particular religious background in this frightened about uh their their disease or or the possibility of dying and uh and then they will say oh yeah you know that reminds me of a story my mother told me or an experience my dad had or something that they themselves had seen and they'd sort of suppressed it or or never talked about uh the experience with anyone else because they were right. weren't sure how to deal with it yeah, we all, our families all have these stories that are quite amazing. Some, you know, a, a ethereal person like a, appeared to someone or they heard a voice or was given a warning, do not walk across this bridge. And then in the morning they discovered the, the bridge was like falling apart and they would have fallen into the water and maybe drowned. And, you know, we all have these miraculous stories, but they're sort of kept within families and never shared with other people and so we all think we're crazy and we all think we we're the only ones to have had a certain experience when they are more common than we would believe if uh, if people shared you know their secret stories <laughs> with the world mhm mm you you also had a quote from uh, sufi mysticism the sound is vibrating in the whole creation when you open your inner ear you will hear a continuous sound which will lead you across all limitations of mind and matter. My beloved is speaking to you all the time. Alas, you do not hear his voice. I thought that was really, really beautiful as well. Um, yeah, and it, but that's, uh, but he describes uh, if you hear the sound, focus on the sound, it will take you beyond the confines of death. And um, and that is a belief in the East that you can have, you can induce your own near-death experience through meditation. And that uh, it's really a kind of dress rehearsal, if you will. Um, um, and it's, uh, they call it uh, death before dying. Meditation is kind of a, a practicing or warming up to the idea of passing on only in a, in a gradual sort of way, of course. Mm -hmm. 
through meditation, but yeah, kind of going to that same same um, realm, only more gradually. There was another quote I was going to... Oh, um, the person who is in tune with the universe becomes like a radio receiver through which the voice of the universe is transmitted. Hazrat Khan. I right. That was excellent, too. And certainly appropriate to this radio show. Right. I, yeah, well, that one. I love using radio as an analogy for <laughs> divine sound or, well, and actually radio waves, the whole idea of spirituality or the existence of a supreme being or other dimensions, radio waves really work because uh, they're invisible, but everyone believes that they're there. Everyone is under the impression that radio is real. <laughs> and even mm -hmm. though you can't see the radio waves, uh, it, it serves as a great analogy that there are other other energies flowing around us that are not necessarily apparent to the five senses, and yet there are ways to tune into them. Well, it's a, it's a world of vibration. Um, whether string theory is true or not, we are all, um, I mean, the, in one form or another, it is, uh, the creation is a vibration. So, Yeah, it certainly is. Um, more than we realize, it's just all all vibrating in different ways. Uh, yeah, I, I like, uh, yeah, the, the quantum physics and uh, science in general and astronomy, you know, they, they really, I see the, the, the many parallels between the sciences and mysticism. So, like, as the saying goes, as above, so below. <laughs> um, there exactly. are a lot of parallels, I think, uh, between the big and the small and the, the macro and the micro. Now, when you get to the eighth heaven and there is no more vibration, apparently, because it's total silence, is that a level that preceded the creation, do you think? Yes, yeah, the the mystics uh, have uh, God beyond light and sound as being the, the source of creation, the first cause, to, to borrow a, a term. Uh, and then light and sound come into existence in different universes. So it's uh, kind of like throwing a pebble in a pond and you get ripples that come out in all directions. And only in this case, what we mean by ripples are dimensions or creations uh, coming into existence. So um, it's uh, God creating the cosmos, uh, like the pebble sending waves on out, and we're we're in one of the waves, and and there are many different heavens or planes, and uh, just sort of at different degrees of nearness or farness, you know, from the center where where God is. Right. Well, if we're um, a vibration ourselves even you know either in the body or out of the body and we aspire to join god in the eighth heaven we're probably aspiring to non-existence because if there's no vibration there then we aren't either well there's that's always a, a question and in fact i if i run into someone uh, uh, on a, a master type figure i hope to ask them about that because they describe the sa the silence beyond the sound in a different sort of way than just no sound, uh, because we can all hear silence, you know, without being enlightened or anything like that. So they seem to mean it differently, you know, passing through levels of light and sound and, and soul travel or going within, uh, but being affected by that experience. And so the, the, the silence on the other side seems to be different from just regular silence. Um, hmm. And I'm not sure exactly what that means. That you know, we're all just part of God. So there is no I anymore. There is no me. There's only, you know, the one. I'm not sure exactly, but I think it does have something to do with just sort of merging back into God and something like that. But yeah, but I have a few questions myself about <laughs> about <laughs> when you get well, beyond a, the, the sound. There was a quote too that you. Uh, included in this from the Nag Hammadi Library. I am the silence that is incomprehensible. I am the voice whose sound is manifold and the word whose appearance is multiple. I am the hearing which can be attained by everyone. Yeah, I love perfect that. mind. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's, that's uh, it's potentially within everyone and we'll just incarnate or reincarnate until we get around to that and, and <laughs> take that journey. 
Well, James, uh, before we run out of time, perhaps you could tell folks um, how they could get a hold of this excellent article, all this wonderful collection of quotes that you've put together. Ah, uh, yes, my blog and article, the the yoga of sound. Uh, uh, they can write, they, they can email me, and I can send the link to them. I have it online at different blog sites. Uh, James at spiritualawakeningradio dot com. And how long did it take you to to write this? Well, actually, uh, a couple of decades, because <laughs> this research is based on on research that's been ongoing for a long time, and so it started out as a few passages. Like the Richard Roll passage I, I noticed in the 80s, in the 1980s. I think Ronald Reagan was still in the White House. And I, I saw it quoted in an, a magazine published in South Africa called Science of the Soul. And I thought, okay, here's an Indian publication talking about a Christian mystic. Interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so just over the years, I, I've noticed these passages, and then with this, have just gotten around to making like one big article on the subject. This is the level at which all religions come together, is the mystical. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, the more mundane aspects of the different religions are always at each other's throats. But when you t- look at the mystics behind all of these traditions, they they are one and the same in in many respects. Yeah, if if the world religions are a circle, in the middle, you know, is where the mystics kind of converge in the, in the oneness in in the center, uh, like the spokes of a wheel analogy. Yeah, that that's where you get into the oneness. Whereas on the outer hub, you get separation. Uh, yes. And but I suppose even in their divisiveness, there is a, is a kind of unity in that they all are the one and only true path with the one book. So in that sense, they're all alike too. Yes. Well, Holy I'm, war, I'm jihad, afraid we're out of you know. time, James. Okay. But thank you, thank you so much for uh, for the last two weeks. It's been extra special, and and we'll have you on again if that's okay. Absolutely. This has been fun. All right. And we thank uh, thank our guests for listening as well. Next week's show, uh, I'll be doing a call-in program. I'll be hosting it from Rimrock, Arizona. So I hope uh, you folks out there will be calling in about anything to do with NDEs. My thanks to IANS for uh, sponsoring our show. And, and uh, well, just thanks for listening. <laughs> 